So this is a joint work with uh, Raphael Pass and Elaine Chi from Cornell Tech and Cornell University. Um, so let me start by first trying to put our work a bit in, in context, sort of why, why we'd want these formal abstractions here, by looking at uh, the, the history of how trusted hardware has been viewed in sort of different um, communities. And we essentially can identify some two, two different trends here. On the, on the one hand, in our own uh, crypto community, especially in sort of theoretical cryptography, um, hardware assumptions have usually sort of been used as minimal set of assumptions that um, allow us to circumvent some theoretical impossibilities, so think, say, um, uh, composable security. And so usually the, the goal here was more to get theoretical feasibility from sort of um, smallest assumption possible and with little concern about the actual practical performance that you end up getting uh, from these protocols. And on the other hand, in the sort of architecture and system security community as well, the goal has more been to sort of view trusted hardware as a way of getting trusted execution of, say, general purpose uh, user programs with a, a focus more on the actual expressivity uh, that the hardware would give you and sort of cost effectiveness and reusability for many different uh, programs. And it's actually interesting to see that um, various projects in this space, both in, in sort of academia and industry, um, so from the hardware and architecture community, have sort of converged to this um, notion of attested execution. And, um, well, uh, first uh, in this talk, I want to sort of try and define this notion a bit more, more formally, sort of see uh, what, what this notion really is. And then sort of the more interesting question, um, so from, a, from a theoretical perspective, well, what does this notion allow us to express, well, or, or not? So let's maybe start from this um, standard setting where you'd have a client that wants to outsource computation to an untrusted server. Um, in parts of this talk, I might use sort of um, terminology and models that are sort of reminiscent of Intel's SGX, but the, the sort of aim is, is to cover the, the essence of attested execution in sort of more in a more general sense um, here. So the, the server who has access to a secure processor can then spin up a, a so-called enclave, so say uh, an isolated um, execution region that can compute this, this program um, in isolation. And the, the trust is essentially bootstrapped by a, a trusted manufacturer that can embed a a uh, secret uh, attestation key inside the, the hardware that can then essentially be used to remotely attest to the, to the correctness of uh, execution of a program. And so this is kind of a nice picture. It tells us uh, kind of what we, what we want from, from uh, attested execution, from secure, uh, from trusted hardware. But it's not necessarily a very precise abstraction um, to work with. So. Why would we want a sort of more formal, ideal abstraction? Well, on the one hand, um, systems that are usually built on top then of the of uh, trusted hardware um, have historically sort of tended to prove security in a sort of ad hoc fashion because of a lack of a sort of formal model um, in which to work with. And so this is something that we'd hope to be able to fix if we had a um, formal and precise abstraction. Um, but it's important to note that we don't and actually can't claim today that any secure processor that you can find on the market will actually realize any form of ideal abstraction that we can um, come up with. And uh, this is sort of, the, uh, I think, the next important step then in, the, in this, um, in this uh, area is that we'd actually want to have secure processors that can be sort of formally verified to actually implement some, some form of uh, ideal abstraction. So let me now dive into the, the actual formal model that we, that we work with. So we model a tested execution as an ideal functionality in a sort of UC style framework. Um, and this uh, functionality essentially um, will englobe all secure processors, so all platforms from a, from a given uh, manufacturer in a, in a registry. And the, the interface uh, of this uh, functionality is pretty simple. So at initialization time, so at manufacturing time, it will um, 
generate um, a public and secret um, key for attestation, and so these keys will be shared by all platforms from the same manufacturer. And at any given time, a uh, remote party might uh, sort of be able to query to get this uh, public key. And when a party that belongs to the registry, so a party that has a secure processor, wants to install a new program, well, we'll the ideal functionality will spin up a new enclave and assign it a, um, a, a unique identifier, sort of a nonce identifier that will allow us to um, identify stateful programs uh, over time. And whenever the party that installed a enclave program wants to run it on a particular input, well, we simply run the, the program that was, uh, that was stored um, and update its state, so essentially its, uh, its memory, and then produce uh, an attestation, so a digital signature, um, under this um, shared secret key over the, the program that was computed and, uh, and the output. So let, let me say a bit more about our, our modeling choices. So we, we model this attested execution um, ideal functionality in the, in the UC framework. So why, why you, the UC framework? So first of all, it's sort of worth noting that uh, trusted hardware is probably not going to be used in, in isolation. It's going to be part of sort of larger protocols and where modular composition seems to be a sort of desirable property when we want to prove uh, security of systems in this space. And so why, why the generalized UC framework? Well, this has to do with the fact that these attestation keys are sort of going to be inherently shared across protocols because, uh, well, the way the system is actually set up in practice, all platforms inherently share uh, share state in, in this sense. And this actually means that attestations that are produced in one run of a protocol have a, have a lifetime that sort of goes beyond that particular uh, protocol. And this is actually a source of some uh, technical difficulties uh, that we have to work with. So a concrete example of a security issue that can come up from this that uh, sort of well known in the cryptographic community is this notion of non-deniability. So if one party produces an attestation in one run of a protocol, then this sort of provides undeniable proof that some party that belonged to the registry, so that has a secure processor, actually participated in this uh, protocol. And I'll, I'll come back to this uh, later. So let's now move on to this maybe more, more interesting question of, well, say we have such a formal abstraction, then what, what can we actually do with it? And on the one hand, it's maybe not very surprising uh, is that we can show that this is a very powerful abstraction. And in particular, it allows us to, um, it sort of, we can show that it implies a notion of obfuscation for stateful programs. It's actually impossible to obtain, even if we go sort of the full uh, route of uh, general cryptographic obfuscation. And uh, we also show that you couldn't be able to do this if the, your trusted hardware was uh, stateless only. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't actually be able to go over this in this talk, but I'll invite you to see our paper for the sort of formal definitions and, uh, and constructions we use here. Um, the part I want to focus on a bit more is actually what to us was a bit more surprising, is that if, starting from this assumption, we try to um, get sort of full uh, UC secure multi-party computation, then things actually turn out to be uh, somewhat more complicated. And I'll go into this now in a bit more detail. So for, for simplicity, we can sort of look at uh, just two-party computation, where we have Alice and Bob that want to commonly compute uh, some function of their inputs. And here what we can show is that actually when both parties have a secure processor, um, then we, it's actually somewhat easy to get um, universally composable secure two-party computation. However, if one party actually doesn't have a secure processor, so in this case, Bob uh, lost his, then um, we actually show that getting uh, two-party computation in a UC secure way is Im impossible. And this is somewhat counterintuitive. So if you recall the sort of informal picture from the, the beginning of this talk, where we looked at how a client might want to outsource computation to a server, 
In this picture, we just considered that the server will have trusted hardware and the client doesn't necessarily have to. Um, but it turns out that it's very hard to prove uh, sort of an ideal notion of, of security in, in this model. And sort of uh, maybe the most intuitive way to, to see what some of the issues can be is through this uh, notion of uh, non-deniability. And so again, here, if, if in this protocol, Alice was the only party who has um, a secure processor at any time actually uses this processor to compute an attestation under this global, um, globally shared key, then if the other party is malicious, it could sort of just use this attestation to convince anyone else that some honest party that belonged to the registry um, of this uh, hardware platform actually participated in the protocol. And while this is something that, first of all, the ideal notion of two-party computation doesn't really uh, allow for, and it's also somewhat intuitive to see that this, this wouldn't be an issue if both parties had a secure processor, because then, well, Bob could have just came up with this attestation himself. So this sort of provides a, non uh, a notion of pl uh, plausible deniability for, for Alice. Um, so maybe one of the more technically interesting results we look at is, well, wh what if we sort of really, really wanted to do things with a single um, secure processor? So it would seem sort of more interesting in practice if not every single party had to, to have a processor from the same manufacturer. And so because of these impossibility results, we actually have to rely on extra setup assumptions and here we, we go for an assumption that has already been used in the space of sort of composable MPC, which is this notion of an augmented common reference string. Um, I won't give a precise definition, but you can think of this as essentially um, a setup that for honest parties is essentially the same as a standard um, CRS. But it also allows malicious parties to sort of query for a so-called identity key, which is essentially just a signature of the party's identity that is then uh, publicly verifiable. And so the, it's important to note here that yeah, the, um, the honest parties will sort of never have to interact uh, with, this, uh, with this CRS during the, the protocol. Um, and although we, we already know from prior work that actually just from this augmented CRS you can get um, secure MPC, uh, the protocols you can get if you include trusted hardware are somewhat interesting because they sort of have a communication complexity between parties that doesn't uh, depend at all on the complexity of the program that you're trying to run because essentially the program will just run inside the, the secure hardware. And so um, this is uh, something that, uh, that might be interesting to achieve. Um, from a, a technical point of view, and this is something that I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail, uh, what's actually quite interesting is that to, to get um, sort of for the simulation proof to go through, for, for us to actually be able to prove security, um, we need to embed some backdoors into the program that's run in the, in the enclave, uh, which is somewhat surprising. This is something, the sort of notion of backdooring programs is something that's come up in work on, say, indistinguishability obfuscation, but it wasn't necessarily clear to us that this, this would pop up um, in this setting as well. And actually most, or not maybe all, of the protocols that we um, show in our paper um, need some notion of, uh, of backdoor in the programs. So let, let me show a concrete example here. So this is for this um, MPC uh, protocol where we'll assume that there's sort of one distinguished party that we call the server that will host this sort of single um, secure processor. And there's a bunch of remote parties that want to do um, uh, uh, MPC. And we have this um, augmented common reference string as well. And uh, the way the protocol works is that the, the program that's running on in the enclave will start by sort of generating um, public key pairs for, for each parties and send these out uh, together with an attestation. Uh, here, in the interest of time, I'll sort of gloss over some details, uh, especially in the actual protocol, the server has to replace this attestation with, uh, with this indis indistinguishable proof to sort of get rid of this uh, non-deniability issue. Um, I'll, I'll let you look at the, the paper if you're interested in the details about this. 
And sort of after this, the construction is pretty standard, so the parties can do a key exchange with the, the enclave, send their inputs encrypted under a shared um, symmetric key. The enclave collects all the inputs, computes the function, and sends out encrypted outputs. So let's now look at sort of the, the, the interesting thing of how, how we would prove security of this, how we would do the simulation. So here we consider that the server is malicious. Um, so in particular, the simulator will be able to also query the, the trusted hardware. And here we'll have to sort of embed trapdoors that will allow the simulator to extract the inputs and equivocate the outputs for, for malicious remote parties. Um, and the way this works is that when the, when, if the simulator wants to know the input that was um, given by some malicious party, it will first call a sort of one, one function in the, in the enclave that allows it, if, if it knows the identity um, key that it got from this augmented common reference string for a particular malicious party, well, then the enclave will just return the, the corresponding secret key. And so because honest parties will sort of never interact with the common reference string, then this sort of allows the simulator to extract inputs from malicious party, but it doesn't affect the security for honest ones. And in a similar way, uh, once the simulator actually learns the output, it sort of has to program the, the enclave to produce this output for malicious parties, and this it can again do by sort of calling another uh, backdoor function inside the, the uh, enclave program that is sort of yeah, never going to be used uh, for in, a, in an honest uh, run of the protocol. OK, so let me now move on to another of our, of our positive results, uh, which has to do with uh, fairness in two-party uh, protocols. And here, by fairness, I essentially mean the standard notion that we want to make sure that if one party learns the result of the computation, then the other party should be also uh, should also be able to obtain the result after maybe uh, some bounded amount of time, even if the first party aborted. Um, we actually know that sort of for, for general functionalities, this is impossible in the, in the plain model. This is a celebrated result by uh, Cleve. And sort of natural question is, well, could trusted hardware help uh, achieve these notions of, of fairness as well? Um, so for this, we consider a sort of enhanced model that we call a clock-aware um, secure processor. It's essentially a piece of trusted hardware that has access to a source of um, relative trusted time. And here we can again show that, assuming that both parties have such secure processors, we can actually get uh, fairness for a general two-party computations. Again, if one of the two parties actually doesn't have a secure processor, things sort of break down. Um, but we can show that for specific functionalities, such as uh, coin tossing, for instance, um, we can get fairness even in this setting where a single party has a secure processor and we also have this um, augmented common reference string. Um, so this, this protocol for fair 2 pc is actually relatively simple, so let me go over it uh, quickly. Um, sort of a pretty standard construction where first the two parties will have their secure processors establish a secure channel over which they can actually exchange their inputs and then they can compute the, the output. So you sort of perform the actual two-party computation. And at this point, the two enclaves will actually just decide to withhold the outputs for a sort of predefined exponential amount of time. And then they will sort of start this tit-for-tat um, communication where at, uh, in sort of iterative fashion they will agree to half the amount of time that they have to wait until they will actually release the outputs to, the, to their hosts. Um, sort of, yeah, this wouldn't be possible if the processors weren't uh, clock aware. And well, it's easy to see here that if one party sort of gets its output at some time t, um, then the other party sort of needs to wait at least, uh, at most, twice that amount of time to also get its output, so we get a nice notion of fairness. And compared to sort of prior approaches here, uh, what's nice in this setting is that the enclaves don't actually need to do any sort of wasteful computation 
such as if you had, say, time lock puzzles, because sort of in an honest run, they just do a number of back and forth communications, and if one of the party aborts, the other party's enclave just sits idle for a certain amount of time. Um, so let me conclude by just sort of looking a bit at the future directions given by our work. Um, so in this work, we, we've looked at sort of formal abstractions of trusted hardware. Uh, we've shown that um, attested execution uh, is a very powerful primitive that allows us to do a lot of you know, fun and interesting things, uh, but that there's also some subtle issues that can arise uh, because of this shared, um, because keys are essentially shared across all, all protocols. And as I alluded in the, in the beginning of this talk, what sort of the next uh, logical step in this direction is to actually come up with a, a secure processor design that could be formally verified to actually implement um, a precise formal abstraction, uh, which would then sort of allow us to uh, get provably secure um, implementations of, of systems on top of, of trusted hardware. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we still have time for questions. Yes. Uh, Mike. So you said your model allows for getting uh, stateful obfuscation, right? Uh, and my understanding is that in case of Intel SGX, you don't actually get state uh, stateful obfuscation because it leaks some sort of uh, access patterns. Yes. So I'm just wondering where the gap is. So yeah, so this is what I mentioned in the, the earlier part in the talk, that actually uh, today we can't, we can't show for any particular um, processor on the market that it actually realizes the, the sort of ideal abstraction that we want. Uh, in the case of SGX, this is for two reasons. Uh, one, because there are these side channels um, that sort of show that things aren't exactly as secure that, as we want. And on the other hand, that even if we could get rid of these side channels, there's actually no way of sort of formally verifying that the processor, what, what the processor actually does. And so um, there, there, that's where the gap currently is, is that sort of between the actual implementation and the formal abstraction, there's sort of a, there's a gap, yeah. Um. So I understand that in your formalism to run an enclave, you need a special instruction. So now, uh, is your a notion of program allows to make this special instruction? So I mean, can you run an enclave inside an enclave? What do you mean by, by that? So I, I, I mean that to run a program inside an enclave, which mm -hmm. will uh, ask to uh, run a program inside another enclave. So I, I don't think we need this in in any of our uh, in any of our constructions. It's possible that our, our formalism would allow you to do it, but none none of our protocols sort of require the uh, sort of a circular uh, notion of uh, um, sort of programs to call other programs. So the for instance the the trapdoors that we have in some of our uh, constructions are really um, part of the original program that is loaded inside, uh, inside the enclave. Yes. <coughs> Hi, so, so your impossibility result for secure computation with uh, single trusted hardware relied on the fact that, that you don't get uh, deniability, right? So you could imagine defining a notion of non-deniable uh, secure computation, and then I wonder whether you looked at that and whether that could be realized. So we, we didn't look at this specifically. This is sort of an approach that's been taken in quite a number of, of prior works of sort of, yeah, weakening the actual ideal functionality that you want to realize. And um, I don't see a reason why this, this wouldn't work in our case, but we, we didn't look at this specifically. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Yes, Evgeny has a question. So I just want to make sure I understand. So in this in this settings, the trusted hardware, uh, I mean, it's completely trusted. It's not like a small thing. It can run like everything. It's like has memories. There are no side channels. I just want to make sure, but usually the kind of problems that people 
have is like you, you know, several people run this thing and things share resources like cash and so on. And, you know, there are all those kind of side channels. So here you just assume if there is a processor, it's if uh, you prove UC security, if it's run several times, uh, I mean, essentially nothing is leaked. Uh, it's just like completely trusted and it will sign everything. I just kind of want to make sure that I understand the model. Is it correct? Right. So you, you essentially would leak the, the sort of size of inputs and outputs and the size of the function. Um, but um, it is a sort of strong model in that, yeah, we, we assume um, no, no, um, no other side channels. We actually consider a, a much, much weaker model um, that uh, we also proposed in a, in a prior work uh, where we actually assume that everything leaks. Uh, so nothing that is executed inside the enclave will actually be um, remain private except for the attestation keys. And this is sort of interesting setting because it's in one sense you could argue that it's much more uh, relevant to what we actually have in practice. And you can still do some pretty interesting things like uh, zero knowledge proofs and, uh, and UC secure commitments in this much weaker model. Okay, where did it appear? Is it, uh, it, it so the um, the prior work appeared at EURSMP earlier this week. And also in this paper, we, we sort of formalize this model uh, more precisely. <laughs>